today we have a question ready. I'm not even sure what my question is. She's picked After up the microphone. That. After all that, <laughs> she's got the microphone. We'll all just let it come through. Oh, good, good, good. So is this on? No. no. Turn the bottom. There we go. You've got the power. You're such a big <laughs> um, So let's see here. I am um, just... I'm happy that I went to the Course in Miracles on Tuesday for the first time in years and years and years. Um, I've been out here in Iowa for four years and I've been starving for spirituality down in Iowa City. So I'm very happy to have found this group and this place and these people and this life up here. And um, after I went to the Course in Miracles on Tuesday, I wanted to just ask, I guess, a couple of things that um, transpired after that was is that I work in a home preschool. I've got <laughs> eight little three and four year olds that are my relationships on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, I had thought prior to this that I had been very, um, Oh, just purely loving and the patience of a saint <laughs> and I'm creative and I could follow what the kids wanted to do. I was a master at being able to just respect their ideas. I was just like in the groove um, in California. And then I came out here and started my own. I wanted to start my own. And so I started my own in-home daycare and it just like hit me like a truck. The very first day, I was completely exhausted. I was burned out after the first day, and I've been doing it now. This is my fourth year. <laughs> um, as of this week, after the Course in Miracles, which isn't particularly easy for me. This it's not like this feel good thing. Like the Sunday service was super feel good. I've gone three weeks in a row ever since I came here. Um, but then Course in Miracles feels like more like oh boy. I got a lot to let go of, and I got a lot, I don't know, I just feel like I'm a baby in the whole thing, so I just want to pre prelude it with that. Um, but after my, my Tuesday class, what started happening is when I got triggered, and when you had mentioned hooks coming up, and that's kind of one that I wanted to go back to, because that's where I'm at right now, is so I um, feel like it's, it's a absolute necessity for me to get past reacting to these hooks. And um, so when stuff came up, this little voice came in and it said, what are you afraid of? It was ang it's anger, that's what it is that keeps coming up. Anger, anger, anger. I mean, even just yesterday, I got mad twice over kids spilling their milk. <laughs> so um, it, during the week, after my Course in Miracles experience on Tuesday, every time mad at something, just internally felt triggered, felt angry, felt agitated, this little voice came in and said, what are you afraid of? And I thought that was kind of cool. And I just wanted to sh sort of sh put that out there to see if if it sounded like I was, um, <laughs> I don't know why, I just wanted some confirmation that yes, I should listen to that voice, which obviously I should because what was happening is I was hearing that voice of what are you afraid of and then I was able to go deeper beyond the anger and I realized that all of the stuff that I'm afraid of is absolutely an illusion. It's, it's things like I'm afraid that I'm not good enough or I'm afraid that I'm going to have to work too hard or I'm afraid that my house is going to get dirty. And all of those things that I'm afraid of kind of boil down to I'm afraid that I won't have control, I guess. I don't know, I've got a lot to do still on it. Um, but it does seem like a really good question for me right now, is to say, what am I afraid of when these things come up? Because as soon as I asked that question, then it made it so that I was a little bit less attached to the anger. I was able to kind of drop the anger more. And I guess my, my question was, was things like judgment. I feel like, what do I do when I judge myself or other people, which I sort of like have habitually been in constant habit of doing, is just judging everything. You know, how do they see me? Are they worth, worth are they, I don't know, you know, just some sort of judgment. 
session? Are they worth my, are they safe? Do I like them? Do they feel loving? Those kinds of things. I'm, I'm a lot of times judging and I guess I feel kind of um, like so, uh, I, well, I have been very, very stuck the last four years. And just after this week, started to feel a little less stuck by asking that question about what are you afraid of. But with the, um, with the judgment thing, I still feel pretty stuck. So I guess it's just, I wanted to sort of talk a little bit more about that. And so what do I do when I, when I have that judgment? How do I um, reframe it, turn it over to spirit, something like that? Well, um, the Course is saying that we are too confused about our, our own identity, so we have to do it through a brother, and that's absolutely true. I, I hear a lot of people say that, how do I love myself? It's all about loving myself, forgiving myself, but I say you, you can't do that except through a brother, and that's really the, the doorway that is pointed out by Jesus throughout the Course is forgive others because that's your way to get in touch with your own innocence. So we don't even have to talk about how do I forgive myself, all this self-judgment. Let's talk about how to forgive your brother and whether there is a willingness to forgive your brother. And I think, um, yeah, for myself, I know that if we really look deeply, all this judgment around the brother all these projections is actually out of this very deep unconscious guilt. It's guilt, guilt of, of our self identity and guilt of the separation from God. So, but that is completely pushed out of awareness. So we don't even know where this motivation of judgment is coming from. You think you really are disliking a person or afraid of a situation is not there at all. So the root is very, very deep. So in order to undo the, the root, we have to give ourselves over to the Holy Spirit. So in a way, um, to notice this judgment is one thing is, you know, bring that to the awareness instead of hiring, uh, hiding them. But on the other way to undo it, we have to open our mind to say, it's not just a quick turnaround. In the mind, it's not a mind game to say, okay, I'm afraid of, um, making a mess in my home so I shouldn't be afraid. That's not the way to do it. The, re the real way to do it to open yourself completely to the spirit and say, you know, you guide me. And sometimes when these questions come to the mind, it's great, what am I afraid of? And yet be open that the solution may not be where you think it is. The spirit will guide you, start to open up to other things. And they're, they're all part of the solution because it's so tricky. It's like that movie, um, Now You See Me, all these magi magicians. The trick of the magician is, you know, it's not really where you think it is. It's all smoke and mirrors to distract your attention to think the problem is right here. I'm afraid of this, I'm afraid of that. But we have no clue how to undo this fear because it's not here, it's not there. So to be open to be healed, we really have to open to allow the Spirit to guide us. I have um, this one person in our community, I remember a few years ago when we were living in the same house, she and this other person just had this constant clash. And for reasons, they, they think they know the reason, they, they just don't like each other. They're in each other's faces all the time, this other person is very, very strong personality, and the other person feels threatened by it, like they clash on every single details, and there's no way to heal it. They can express, they can talk about it, cry about it, there's no way. And then, just, I was talking to her, and one day, just as I was talking, I, I heard, what is your situation with your husband? And she was just saying, you know, she was separated from her husband for years, but she does not feel to get into divorce, or she does not feel to, to look at that area, or there's some, a lot of str 
extremes in her life, but she moved to the community and completely put that out of her mind. I don't want to deal with that area of my life. But, you know, when something that is still in the mind that is ready or the spirit wants you to look at and to address, not necessarily to change the situation as a goal, but just to start to see what is you're afraid of, to look at those things, those areas, but we say, okay, not now, not I don't want to look at it. Then the projection is all going on to this direction. And we're trying to solve this interpersonal um, conflict. There is no way to solve it. We don't even know where it's coming from. So gradually, we just allow pray together and allow the spirit to show, just be open that we don't have to push anything or make anything to happen, but just allow your mind to open and truly follow the spirit when you feel the prompt to look at certain areas, address certain things, do not, you know, push away from your awareness. And that is the, the way of healing. The healing is holistic. It's actually not this specific situation, this specific conflict being healed. It's your mind completely being healed in all areas. And we don't know which, you know, relates to which. So it's like a complete surrender I don't know the problem, so I don't know the solution, but you know, so let me just look at what is the surface and hand it over and then allow the healing to come through. Yeah, and it's the sense too that I've used this preschool analogy um, to kind of convey some real deep metaphysical ideas from the Course. Um, because this whole idea of judgment, you know, if you took the Sermon on the Mount and you just boiled it down to two words, it's judge not. Uh, really, it's just two words is, is the core of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, that was, you know, 2,000 years ago and, and the human race has been trying to <laughs> practice that with, with not a lot of success. It's almost like they can tell intuitively, almost sentimentally, that that is the way. They've been given the key to the door, but they just have had a heck of a time finding how the key goes in and turns, because it's not unlocking. So, I would say, this first thing we look at this thing of judgment, because we're told judge not. How and when, or what was the purpose, when did judgment seem to arise? Uh, we know it's, it's of the ego, but what purpose does judgment serve? So we could say that there's this thing called the fall from grace. Not in reality, because love is still love, but the seeming fall from grace is described in the Bible and all the perennial uh, religions. Everybody has their own story of the fall from grace. So, the fall from grace is the beginning of consciousness, which is the domain of the ego. And the mind in the state of heaven is so loving, so joyful, so harmonious, so peaceful. Obviously, there's no problems in heaven. It's just pure, eternal love and gratitude and joy. But the fall from grace is a, from a state of joy and happiness and love into a state of chaos and conflict. Now, where does judgment come in? Because there's no judgment in heaven. So the judgment is starting to come in in the chaos and the conflict. Judgment is a device that came about after the separation in order to bring stability and control into a chaotic situation. So, it, it is an invention of the ego to try to stabilize chaos. Because if the mind is in total chaos, it will give up the chaos to go back to the love. So you see, the ego invented judgment as a way of minimizing chaos without letting it go. The, the ego wants to keep the chaos, so it minimizes it uses defense mechanisms, and defense mechanisms are always designed to reduce fear while keeping it. Reduce fear while not letting it go. So judgment, you see where Jesus is saying, judge not, because he's saying, if you want to return to the awareness of the kingdom of heaven, you have to let go of the defense mechanisms against it. Now let's go to your question, because this is recorded for the whole universe here. Um, it's a very good question, it's a very basic question. What am I afraid of? And then you mentioned a few things which were going on in your mind. One of them was fear of loss of control. So 
So I would say we're onto it there in the sense that judgment was was a mechanism that was invented to bring control into chaos to minimize fear. And therefore, control in the ego system is extremely important. That in fact, the ego would say without control, without rules and control, all would be chaos. <laughs> and Jesus is saying, without rules and control, all would be love. So you see we have two different advisors in the mind now. One is saying, give up the rules, give up the control, you've got pure chaos. And the other one is saying, give up the rules and control, the judgments, you have pure love. Now, this is important, we'll go back to this thing of, what am I afraid of? Now, the answer to that is something that I, I remember asking Jesus point blank one time, what is it, give it to me straight, what am I afraid of? And the answer was so astonishing that after I heard his answer, I said, I don't get it. We're going to have to come from a different angle because that does not compute. That does not make sense. But the answer to what am I afraid of is love. Terrified of love. When you believe in the ego, and the ego is the belief that there is no God and no love, then there, it generates a, a projection onto love. There's a terror of love. That's why there's a terror of the Holy Spirit. And that's why all of us in unity, religious science, all these beautiful new thought religions are talking about love, 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 and follow the Spirit and everything. Why is it people like talking about listening to the Spirit? <laughs> more than actually listening to the Spirit. <laughs> there has to be some kind of enormous resistance. Imagine if the Spirit's available to you, God's voice speaks to me all through the day, and you're still praying and saying, I'm not sure quite what the Holy Spirit's message is here. There has to be some kind of resistance going on. There's a terror going on of, of listening to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the representation of love. And the great terror, the fear, is the fear of love. So when I asked Jesus, what, give it to me straight, what am I afraid of? He said, love. I said, I don't get what you're talking about. I mean, I, I want love. I want loving relationships. I want more love in my life with my cat, with every, I, I want love, love, love. I'm, I'm a lover. I, I want, and you're telling me I'm afraid of love. I just, that's, I don't get that. Can we come from another angle? If, okay, if I'm defending against love, if I'm defending against love and I'm afraid of love, and I'm going like this to the light, what am I defending for? If I'm defending against love, I must be defending for, I must be trying to guard and protect something. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, the self-concept. Mm -hmm. That's the image that you've made that's unlike love. You're trying to protect an image that was made to take the place of love. So now that is helpful. That I can relate to, because I can see I've got all kinds of pride and, and attachments to concepts and images that I believe I am. No wonder I'm afraid of love if I'm protecting that image. And what is that image but control? Again, it's protecting that control mechanism that was invented by the ego, because there's a fear of if I lose control, then what? You know, the ego is saying, chaos, chaos, and, and there's part of the mind that must believe that. So, I would say that, that A Course in Miracles is just a 1200 and some page book that is just an eloquent dissertation on one thing, the serenity prayer. <laughs> and underneath that big book that's this thick, is simply the serenity prayer. Now there's three aspects to the serenity prayer. That which you can control, that which you cannot control, and the wisdom to know the difference. To me, that's why the 12 steps work. That's why the serenity prayer and 12 steps is such a healing mechanism for so many people all over the planet, because it really is the Course in Miracles in a simplified form. And the, and the wisdom to know the difference between what you can control and what you can't control is the Holy Spirit, or the higher power, whatever you want to call it. Atman, whatever, spirit. 
Now, what can you control? Well, Jesus tells us in the Course that you can control the direction of your thinking. In other words, if there's thoughts that align with God, we call it the right mind, and then you have thoughts that uh, align with the ego, or are denial of the wrong mind, you have choice. You can control the direction of your thinking. He does come right out and say that. You can control the direction of your thinking. It's going to take practice. You know, you have, we think it's difficult to change behaviors, you know, like stop smoking, lose weight, and so on and so forth. The behaviors are nothing compared to changing your mind about your mind, letting go of an entire belief system and thought system that's based on control, and opening to you don't know what, which is really the spirits, trust me, trust me, relinquish control and all is love, the spirit keeps saying all is love, all is love, and the ego's going, don't trust, hold on to your control, because you're going to have total chaos. So I give the preschool example of the preschool teacher who comes who goes away from the class for a while, and the class is unattended. And when the teacher comes back, she opens the door, she goes into the room, and it's been a major food fight. Uh, they, <laughs> it's been lunchtime, there's ice cream on the ceiling, there's food, there's ketchup in the, on the rug, the girls, the boys, it's smeared in fish. It's a major food fight. The teacher has just gone away for a while, and she comes back to the preschool class, and she walks in, and her first thought is, chaos. This, you know, this, <laughs> this is a preschool, especially if you own the preschool, you're an in-house preschool. You've gone away, and you've come back, and it's been like a major food fight. It's just everywhere. It's hanging from the wall, from the ceiling. It's just they've got into it. And, and, and the first thing the teacher does is throws out her arms, <laughs> stop! <laughs> And what the teacher will try to do in what's perceived as chaos, a major food, is to bring order in the chaos. Okay, all the girls over there in a the line, all the boys over there in a the line, drop, drop it, <laughs> drop it, whatever is in your hand. You, know, you see, the first inclination of the preschool teacher after the chaos is, is apparent is to try to bring control and bring order in the chaos. That's what the ego is trying to do. That's what the judgment's all about, is trying to bring order into chaos. And we all know this. You know, when you finally move out of your parents' house, you get your own house, you're not living under their rules anymore, you know, my way or the highway, now it's my way. <laughs> you, you come to your own my way. You get to pick the color of your paints on the walls, you get to put the style in the room, dress the way you want to dress, you know. You're in your own little kingdom now, your own little queendom. You're not under mom and dad's rules anymore. You can, you can control your life. You don't always have to, to obey mom and dad's rules. You make your own rules. That's the same thing, the ego. Make your own rules. Live your life any way you damn well want to. You know, it's, it's, it's the same egoic, autonomous, I'll do it my way and it's going to be better. I'll have a more ordered life. Okay, I came from a dysfunctional family, but now I'm in charge here, and I'm not going to live dysfunctions. I'm going to order it and control it my way, and then you have a spouse that comes along, and then <laughs> you've got the same thing reenacted over. Or maybe you get a pet. Maybe you have a, an animal, you have a pet in your house, and the same thing happens. You know, you see the reenactment of the separation, where it's a struggle between the creatures to gain control. It could be husband and wife, it could be the parents and the kids. I've gone into families where, where um, there's like teenagers, and I go in and, and I meet with the parents and this and this, and they'll say, what do you see, David? What's going on here? And it's like, sometimes the teenagers are literally running the house. The, the parents have become the slaves <laughs> now, instead of my way or the highway, it's flipped around. The teenagers are living the high life, and the parents are literally in the servant role. And so I'll call a spade a spade, because I want everyone to realize their full potential and escape from this idea of who rules who, and just come to perfect equality and see 
God is the one in charge, and when we follow God's law of love, we experience ourselves as love. So these are just examples where by the, the preschoolers are just, the reason you may get stressed out is because the ego in, inside wants a sense of order and control. And these are symbols and mechanisms being used by the Holy Spirit to trust, to come inward to the guidance that Francis was talking about, and to actually let go of control entirely. First it starts out as guidance, so you may have guidance. People say, why boundaries? Why do we need to set so many boundaries? And I say, well that's just because of fear. That's why boundaries are limits, and you have to set them out of fear. But the Holy Spirit will work with that, and can help you in guided boundaries, or guided loosenings, so that, so that you become more confident and trusting in the Spirit, and can let go of this self-concept of being a preschool teacher who has to be in charge, or, you know, it could be a, a, a parent-child relationship, or it could, it could have any number of things, but we can control the direction of our thinking. And the second part of that is, in the Rules for Decision, Jesus comes out with this beautiful sentence. He says, you have no control over the world you made. Isn't that a lovely sentence? No control over the world you made. I even had a, an early teaching I did back in the 1990s called No Control Over the World, where the whole talk's about the serenity prayer. You know, some of you know the serenity prayer, and you know those 12 steps, you know, life became unmanageable. And, you, you know, it's, it's out of control, and it's a sur surrender or a letting go of that attempt to manage and control that brings us back into the grace, into the spirit of grace that we were created with. So this gives you like a sense of what this is all about. Really you have a huge opportunity there. And the stressful part is trying to still exert the control over the world, we'll call it. And the spirit is just saying, listen, we can do mind training here and you can actually control the thoughts in your mind so fully that when the light arises in your mind and you give your full ascendance to that light, that attack thoughts will no longer be able to enter. Judgments will no longer be able to enter your mind of light because you've so fully given it over to the source of light and to the Holy Spirit that, that literally you don't that whole idea of control just starts to fade away. Where there actually comes a state of mind where you don't even have to control the direction of your thinking. You become so aligned with God that you simply be as you were created. So as a preschool teacher, would the response possibly be, okay, go outside and go at it with the food fight? I mean, like, can you, can you briefly give a... Give a um, an example of okay. what the pre how the preschool teacher, guided by spirit, might be able to respond. <laughs> well, I'll give you a parable from the life of David. Um, David wasn't ever a, a preschool teacher, but uh, David was in the College of Education at the University of Cincinnati, and, and would go out on to different classrooms to observe. And when David would go to observe these many, many different classrooms, um, I, it would be this sense of noticing that some, some classes had all these rules written all over the, the place, and the place seemed like chaos. In other words, the children were not following any of the rules. And then I'd walk into a class, I'd go from classroom to classroom just observing how the teachers and students were interacting. I went into one classroom, and they were the most kind, sweet, loving, uh, it was amazing. It was some of the same kids, even. I would follow them, and it would be a wild chaos in one thing, and then they'd be, their whole behavior would change in another room, and I'd say, fascinating, what's going on in this room? There's such a sense of presence, and honoring, and respect. And then some of the same kids that were in the, in the, the chaotic, throwing paper wads, and everything over here, and they just, oh, they become like angels in the next classroom. I'm fascinated, you know, because I'm just always observing. So I would, I would spend time talking to 
the teacher saying, wow, what's going on in your classroom? It's amazing to watch the relationship you have with the kids. And she was, I said, you don't even have any rules. There's no rules on your walls. There's rules all over the walls over there. And there's paper wads flying and nobody's respecting anything. What's going on over here? She would say, well, at the beginning of the class, before we get started on the first day of the semester or quarter or whatever, I talked to him about the golden rule. Because I, I believe I, in living the golden rule. I think it's important to live the golden rule. So I talked with all the kids about how important and valuable <coughs> the golden rule is. And that sets the tone for the whole, the whole year. Because it's her value, it's her mind that she's bringing it, the gift of the golden rule. And the kids just reflect that. Some of the same kids that are throwing stuff in that one, they come and there's a respectfulness. So, in terms of how far are you willing to go with this, I remember I had a student of mine back in the 1990s, and she and her husband had two children, and a little boy and a little girl, and they said, the student was saying to me, David, we just love you, we respect you, and this would be really helpful for our children. We want to take a vacation away from our kids. We want to go off and you know, have pilot's license. We want to fly away. We'll fly away for a whole week and we would like you to come up and live in the house with the kids. We think it'd be such a blessing for the kids to have you live there and think, here, we'll just leave you some money. You can decide what you want to do with food, going out, recreation, movies, whatever you want to do in the house. We totally love you, David. We totally trust you. We turn our children completely over to you because we're going on vacation. We need to get away for at least a week. So they did. So when I got there, um, it was pretty quick that the, the children right away, they knew that mom and dad had boundaries. That there were certain things that they could get away with, couldn't, you know, the rules of the house and this and this. So I think initially when I got there, they knew me and they loved me and everything, but they went fishing to try to find out what my boundaries and limits were, like they do with adults. Kids will do this. They'll fish. You know, when we were in, in school, we had a, a substitute teacher come in. We knew what we could get away with and not with the regular teacher, but when the substitute teacher came in, we tried to fish and push to find out how much we could get away with. So this is what the kids were doing. They were fishing. They were looking for David's boundaries. Wow. Where is this guy's boundaries? Does he have any boundaries at all? Mom and Dad are gone and we're here for a week with... Oh, wow, this is great. So, the day one, um, we Basically, we played, we, we took the uh, living room apart, um, all the furniture we decided to make, like it was like a submarine, and we get sheets out and, and put the furniture and arrange and draw things over so they could be, and we go all in the submarine, and we would play, we would rearrange the furniture, you know. Parents trusted me, give me the house, give me the kids, they give me the money. You know, it's like, let's have some fun here. Uh, let's be inspired, and so we played, and we played, and then finally, I mean, we played so much that we hardly thought about food, and then finally when the kids are like, we're hungry, we're hungry, uh, I said, well, what do you want, what do you want to eat? Mickey D's, McDonald's, I said, great, get the cash, Monday night, Mickey D's, Tuesday night, Mickey D's, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday. <laughs> of course, they gave us the money. It was no problem at all. Mickey D's. Every day. Because why? Because it's just what's in this, the flow given. I've got no preferences. I don't believe in nutrition. I don't believe in any of this. I've got no qualms about anything in the world. My mind is emptied of the beliefs of this world. Hence, no boundaries. Hence, we had a ball at Mickey D's. We did a Playland, we'd have our burgers and fries, whatever, apple turnovers, whatever we did. So that was that. Then, as we went along, the children got so happy, they were like in paradise. They were just like, 
This is great. There are no boundaries and limits. It's just pure joy. And so we continued to play every day. We would have the, the, the kids got so happy with some of the work, I would say giddy. The kids eventually got giddy because there was such a joy of being spontaneous in the moment and living spontaneously from inspiration that we would just be inspired from one playful thing to the next, to going to our Mickey D's. And it was a very inspired week of playing and rejoicing. I think maybe halfway through the week, the kids were both so giddy, they were just giggling and laughing and giddy and everything, that I think the girl, um, she went <laughs> and she spit. And I remember in one of our play sessions, I just remember this goob goober flying across, <laughs> across in the air, it's like in slow motion. And so we're just in such glee and everything. At that point I had a beard, a front station of beard. And I do remember the goober flying across and landing in the beard. And then as soon as that happened, the little girl and the little boy looked at me like... <laughs> and when they saw me smiling and laughing, they saw, obviously, there was no boundary around goobers, either. I mean, I heard they spit on Freud in some of his talks, but see, he took it. He didn't believe in God. He took it personal. Somebody spitting on him was seen as an affront. It was offensive for Sigmund Freud to give a lecture and have somebody spit on him. But not for me. This is David. This is the parable of David, a new day. Uh, this was, so, as soon as the, the spit balled, and as soon as the goober landed, and I laughed. It was a spit fight. They just spit all over the place and everything like this. And that was our next game, and then we went and showered and cleaned up and went on to our next game, you see. Nothing is offensive. I just was, got a, a somebody, Jenny wrote to me about that was, when, I think in one of my books, My Meaning of Scripture, or one of the books, I had put, um, when you are offended, you are offended in Christ. And she was wondering what that meant, offended in Christ. And what that really meant was that, that we are never offended by what people say or do. We're afraid of love, and we're denying our identity as love. And that's where the offense comes in. Christ is always there. Christ is always present. But whenever we have an offense, we need to pluck the offense out of our mind. Let the Holy Spirit pluck it, because it's always some self-concept that we believe in. We believe we're human, we believe we're a man or a woman, we believe we're a teacher or something, a student. We need to pluck that offense and, and come holy empty hands unto God as, as to know the Christ, which is really not offended. Christ is never offended in anything, because Christ is spirit, and spirit can't be offended. So, I gave this example because uh, that was how it played out for me in that particular uh, parable, in that particular scene. And then eventually the parents did come home, and the kids didn't want to let the parents in the house. <laughs> they were like, no, we don't want this to end. <laughs> Why don't you go on another vacation, actually, you know. But then I sat down with all of them, I said, no, this is beautiful, because this is I explained a few things and what, what the purpose was and, and what the potential was. That was just a learning opportunity for them. So, it's not saying that you should try any of these things <laughs> in your classroom, but it is saying in that direction, when, whenever you notice a feeling of, of control coming up, or a feeling of frustration coming up, or the anger, that we're never upset for the reason we think, and, and anger is really never justified. The ego would always have us justify the reasons why we're good and angry, and they should have known better, and da da da. But it's just a huge opportunity for forgiveness, to let the Spirit guide us to release the limits that we place on ourselves and the judgments in our own mind, and then live in a state of happiness and glee from not buying onto those beliefs, buying into those anymore. Okay, you just said something about forgiveness. In the moment when you're frustrated with these kids and the anger is coming from somewhere else, and you said it's all about forgiveness, 
do you have to have a specific action or person that you forgive, or can you just like kind of do a blanket or all-encompassing version of forgiveness? Is that okay? Yeah, it's, I would say, well, the mind believes in specifics. Jesus says we have to practice with specifics. Like, you know, you have to use what you believe in. So, it seems specific as you're practicing, but actually when you go fully into what it is, you find out it's, it's not specific at all. You're, shift, you're shifting your identification with the doer, with the person. And some of you know, like the Four Agreements, Miguel Ruiz, one of them is, don't take anything personally. That's exactly what forgiveness is. It's, it's going so deep into your mind, and freeing your mind of all these misidentifications, all these false ideas of who you are, and emptying your mind, like Buddha and Jesus have both said, and coming into that place where you're taken there by the Holy Spirit to a place where you're, you're not identified or attached with anything of time and space, anything of linear time anymore. It's very much like Francis was just saying that when you try to do it, like in terms of saying, telling yourself to say the words, a lot of people do that with the Course. Um, they'll take workbook lessons or they'll take something and they'll try to, to tell themselves. Or even with the observer, they'll try to say, okay, I'm the observer, I'm the observer, but there's still beliefs underneath that have to be exposed. Just by, that's what happens with mantras in the East, you know. Mantras are used to try to focus the mind and, and give the mind something to latch on to and everything, but until you're taken by the Spirit on this process of undoing, then you thoroughly can't completely forgive as long as you still have unconscious assumptions, beliefs, and grievances. So that's why the prayer of the heart should always be, Holy Spirit, show me the way. You lead the way. Be you in charge. You know, I would but follow. Um, instead of trying to figure out what our future pathway to God should be based on our past learning, we need to be more humble than that. Because our past learning got us nowhere. <laughs> we've been trying to, for 2,000 years we've been trying to judge not. And our past learning is so anchored in there that it's, it's literally like, a covering over, it's like a covering, a film that's covering over our, the light in our mind. So we, we have all these examples of how our, our seeming lives and form have not turned out anything like we thought. Uh, when Frances was growing up in, in Beijing, you know, her family system was basically, um, if you can't see it, smell it, taste it, touch it, it, it doesn't exist. Uh, there was no teachings at all that there was a spiritual reality. It was almost, you know, have a good education, get a good job, be safe and secure and attain and accumulate in this world to empower yourself as a person to live the best life that you can, and then you'll die. So you might as well, you know, make a pretty good life of it before you die. And that was the belief system. And I had a pretty similar one, even though I was raised in a Christian church. We didn't talk about feelings, we didn't talk about thoughts and beliefs. You know, if the race riots of Chicago came on, you could bet the television channel would get changed. Because uh, I, David was raised as a child in the 60s, and there was Vietnam and race riots going on and all kinds of things, and I'm sure as a lot of families, it was like, change the channel, you know, it was like a protectionism. Like, we want to keep you in a nice, safe, wasp family. White, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant cocoon. And who Vietnam, but let's not talk about that to where, uh, you know, anything that was controversial, it was like, kind of brushed under the, the rug, you know. And, and we went to Bible school, and we learned the teachings of the Bible and Jesus and everything, but there was a lot of protectionism that was going on. I think I had, to, in the 70s, I had to go back and rediscover the 60s. You know, because I wasn't taught, my parents weren't presenting to me a full picture of the 60s. I was, I was simply seeing reflected what I believed in, and there was a lot of protectionism. So then I had to get into, 
opening my mind in many ways, which was very helpful on my own, initiating that. And I feel there's a spirit behind it all, just slowly opening my mind up. Until finally the Course came into my life, and then that was part of really open, taking the blinders off. You know, really taking a good, honest look at what was going on in my consciousness. And that takes me to forgiveness, you know, that it's, it's, a, it's a holistic way of forgiving. We really need to reach a holistic state of forgiveness, that we see that it's not really about the specifics. Like for example, if it was like a tree, you have to start with the leaves and the branches because that's all you know. You know, you could say the tree trunk's not real and there is no tree. Well, but if you believe in the tree and the branches and the leaves, you have got to start with the branches and the leaves and start tracing it inward. That's what I was doing all these years seemingly going, starting off with the leaves and I, I would really listen and watch and observe my feelings and my thoughts around all the leaves. And eventually I got down to the tree trunk and saw that, I'm looking at a tree right now, I saw that all the branches and all the leaves were just offshoots of the trunk. And they were as illusory as the trunk was. But the Spirit is so practical, it knows that we have to go through an awakening process where we're slowly convinced of the reality of love and the unreality of fear. And Jesus says, don't be afraid that you'll get hurled into reality. <laughs> it's good that we're not hurled <laughs> into abstraction. <laughs> we just get piece by piece based on what we, we're ready for. You just had two, the other version of hurl come into my mind. <laughs> right. Rather than throw yeah. Them. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've always wondered though, what To get the sun. Oh, I'm sorry. We're recording it for the whole world. What, what would be so bad about that? About what? Just being hurled into, you know, <laughs> being hurled into reality. What's so terrible about that possibility? Well, it, I think it again come back. It comes back to this fear of love. For example, imagine that. Uh, it's really impossible to be hurled because the mind is so addicted to the darkness <laughs> that uh, it really couldn't be hurled. For example, if you had a child who was asleep and dreaming and was having a nightmare, and you walked in on that child, let's say you were the mother, and you walked in on that child, and the child's tossing and turning, clearly having a nightmare, and you went up and you just tried to just shake them to snap them out of that nightmare as quickly as possible. Really just go and shake them in the bed. What happens is, if you go and shake a child who's having a nightmare, the child will incorporate the shaking into the dream. It could very well be perceived that there's a, that there's a monster <laughs> that's got a hold of them, and they're interpreting that they're being shaken and grasped by a monster. When you're in a dream, you know how you sometimes incorporate the alarm clock, and you need to get up for an important thing and all of a sudden you've got this sharp noise and it's just right incorporated in a dream. When the mind's asleep and dreaming, it just does that. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't want to be awakened uh, when it's in a nightmare. So what Jesus says is when he says, you know, don't be afraid that you'll be hurled into reality, it's basically saying that you can't be hurled into reality. You're too frightened of reality and you're not going to be make it that way. That would just be more traumatic than beatific, he says. So basically, you have to go from nightmares to happy dreams to waking up from the dream. You don't go from nightmares into reality. And, and you can see the gentleness with that. That's just, he's just describing, that's just the way it is. You have to go through a transition of happy dreams. So in the parable of David, that's just the way it's gone. It went from kind of denial, repression, of shy, extremely shy, like a wallflower, and, and then I had to go through a transition of years, seemingly, where there were tears, the face was wet with tears, and the dog licking the, the tears, the salty tears, and, and progressively through relationships. You know, when we go into relationships in this world, the ego wants to get something out of the relationship. You better believe it's, it's looking for something. 
And when it doesn't get what it wants, then it will break off relationships. It will say, there are many fish in the sea, and you're not one of them anymore. <laughs> and it will simply move on to try to get what it wants. But progressively, as you get more into giving, and extending, and away from the getting mechanism, you do start to awaken, your relationships start to be lighter, more gentle, more free-flowing, you start to come into the happy dream. You know, they start to reflect where your heart is. So, it, it would seem like people do say, you know, let's get it over with as quick as possible. Like I have heard, of course, miracles say that, you know, to Jesus, hurl me! <laughs> Just hurl me! <laughs> If you don't hurl me soon, I'm going to kill myself, so hurl me. You know, it's, you know, you see how it's still, there's a, there's still a, 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 bargaining. a bargaining going on. And, and it's still not a recognition of, of how addicted the mind is to the darkness. It's, it's saying, wake me up, snap me out of it. But, but it still has a, a clinging going on that has to be loosened. Okay, just a little bit ago you said, um, you have no control over the uh, world you make. Is that right? You made. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. But I think that we have complete control over the world we make because it's through our thoughts and actions that we make this world. I mean, maybe not even our actions, but our thoughts. And yesterday you talked about, um, you know, we can choose to turn to the light, or we can choose to do other things. So I feel like our world is what we make it. So we do have control over it. What What do you think about that? Yeah, ultimately we have control of our state of mind, but but the linear world is like a script, and so. Saying you have control over the world would almost be like going to a movie theater and saying you have control over the script. Um, what the script is already in the can, it, it's shot, it's just a projection of something that's already done. The movie has been completed, it just has the illusion of as if it's unfolding and playing in the theater. But um, I use the example of times of going to see the movie like Gone with the Wind. And you see it maybe 20 times, and after about 15 times, you're starting to get a little irritation up at Fred Butler, the way he's speaking to Scarlett, you know, frankly, my darling, I don't give a damn. It would be like saying, you know, you've seen it 15 times, and you start to get to that scene, and you go, Red? Red? I'm a little tired of this. You treat her, you treat her like a lady. And you get up to the scene again, and he goes, frankly, my darling, I don't give a damn. Because it's, it's in the script, it's the past. Everything in the linear world is, is part of a prearranged, destined script. So when we have books and movies like The Secret, that show the power of the mind, the power of thought, and the power of manifestation, it really kind of implies, too, that you, know, you can make the world to be any way you want to make it. You have complete control over it. Not so, actually. Uh, some people will tell me that, gee, the New Age thought says you can create your own reality. Isn't the Course teaching uh, the same thing that the New Age teachings are teaching about creating your own reality? No, it's not <laughs> teaching that at all. It's basically saying that God is the creator of reality. God creates your reality as spirit. And the most you can ever do is accept your reality as God created you. You don't have the power to invent yourself to be any way that you want to be, to make yourself over, to redo yourself, to manifest different worlds, different things, explore different realms, all the exciting stuff like on the Discovery Channel. No, 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 no. It's, the Course is not teaching any of that. The Course is teaching God is the creator of reality, God is the author of reality. You can accept God's authorship. And you can humbly accept yourself as the Christ, which is the way God created you, and you have no power whatsoever to make yourself any way different. You know all this stuff in this world about uniqueness and diversity? No, 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 no. All this stuff about um, 
all the great choices we have, the wonderful choices. Most of us were raised with choice being a good thing. We wanted to be, we didn't want a deterministic world, we wanted to, to be able to choose to be however we want to be. That's even the slogan of the army, isn't it? Be all that you can be. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's talking about the Christ. If it is, that's good, but if it's talking about becoming a good killing machine and being all you can be as a killing machine, no, 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 no. Some people, I mean, the people that I've worked with over the years, I went through all this darkness, and then the people come and they go through such darkness, I mean, really dark stuff, just really dark, and they'll say, David, when does it end? When does it end? It's like a dark tunnel where you just go in there and it's darker and darker. Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? When will it end? When will it be over? And one time I, I said to Suzanne, she said, well, can you give me a very concise description of the awakening process? And I said, yeah. Damn, 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 ah. <laughs> she, I forgot all about that. She reminded me at a recent festival. She said, that's what David told me. Damn, 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 ah. You know, it's the damn, damn part is the part when you still believe in linear time, and you're still hoping that this is going to work out in linear time, and even some of these really neat uh, philosophies like the secret, for example, and manifesting. Um, maybe even Abraham Hicks, you know, there's a lot of teachings right now that I say are more at the foothills of taking you towards the mountain. You know, they're actually good stepping stones, and there's really nothing wrong with manifesting in the sense, if you see the purpose underneath it is empowering your mind, of seeing you're not a victim of the world you see, that actually has many gains to it. And that's why I, I never poo-poo power of positive thinking or manifesting or whatever. But then when people come and they say, can you give me the full extent of it? Because I remember one time I was in Michigan and I was giving a talk, I think up in Lansing, and, and I was halfway, I was talking, 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 and we said, let's just take a break. And we took a break in mid-afternoon, and this woman came up to me and she said, I'm the manifesting lady. I manifest everything. I can manifest cars, houses, soulmates, diamonds, you know, she just, during the break she told me, she has spent her whole life, she can manifest anything in this world, and has done so many times. So I talked to her and I said, well that's great, that's really great. I said, I think when we come back from the break, I want you to start witnessing and telling uh, all of your manifesting stories, because I think that will be very empowering for this course group. <laughs> And it will, show, it will help show the power of the mind. And then I'll take it from there, I'll take it to the next step. So she did, she gave the full manifesting thing. A lot of people in the group, they were so fascinated by that, they, didn't, they wanted to put the course aside. <laughs> They'd rather take her course <laughs> than the course. <laughs> they were like, ooh, this is good, this is good stuff. I want to learn how to do what you do, forget the course. They said, no, no, let's just take it where this is going, you know. We, we aren't stopping and manifesting here. That's just a step on the, on the ladder of coming back to the power of the mind and the power of thought. I said, imagine to, if you could manifest anything at all, uh, and you got really good at manifesting forms, any kind of form, partners, soulmates, yachts, you know, on and on and on, multi-billionaire, whatever you wanted to do. Imagine that you kept doing that, do you think that would ever satisfy you, even if you were an amazing manifester? And they all were like, hmm, no, there's, there's definitely something beyond manifesting. They all were aware of that. They could kind of go in their minds and they could play that out. And they said, no, we really would want like lasting peace. If we could have a gift that was even beyond manifesting whatever form we want, we would want lasting peace. I said, yeah. And that's exactly what this Course is about. It's about awakening to the Kingdom of Heaven, to everlasting peace, eternal love. And so, they said, how does that work though? Why, why is manifesting so alluring, and, and where is the shortcoming? Can you tell us the shortcoming of manifesting, so we can kind of get over it in our minds before we have to play it out? 
And I said, well, it's all about linear time again. Whenever you say you want to manifest something, and you want to bring something into form, there's this belief that you have a mind and thoughts. And you can actually use the power of that mind and thoughts to bring something into form. Money, a soulmate, a car, a house, a diamond bracelet, something or other. But you're presuming you know the form that is best. You're still looking at the past, which is a past of images, and you're deciding you want something that you've already experienced, that you've already deemed valuable, and you're trying to bring it into form. And you're really perpetuating linear time, and perpetuating the dream, by trying to bring it into fruition again. And we can manifest this stuff. Uh, we do. We have, yes. <laughs> and the ego is never, ever satisfied, satisfied with what we get. Yes, that's exactly it. You have used the power of your mind to make up a world of unreality, and the ego is still not satisfied. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit also about choice, because I a couple of years ago I had this mystical experience, and in it I saw the world has completely finished. It's gone. It's finished. So what is going on now is kind of, of like an echo. The source of the sound is gone. And the echo is, is just reverberating in the mind. The mind is reliving it again and again, not letting it go. It's holding on to the idea of it's still happening, and then pretending that I don't know the outcome, and I'm one of the characters in this whole thing. But the truth is, it's already gone. And in that, there is absolutely no choice in this world. It's already finished. So when I was when I was in that experience, and actually when the experience finished, I, I remember I just sat there and thinking, there is nothing to do. What, 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 what am I here to do? And there is only one thing to do, which is to see it as it is, to see the force as false, and not to pretending that you know I, I need to be stressed about it, I, I need to create a better script, because it's already gone. So that to be able to see that, it was very clear there is only one thing to do, which is forgiveness. Forgiveness gives me the vision to see the force as force, to see everything as it is. So in a way, there is nothing in this life that needs to, do, to be done except forgiveness. Forgiveness is our only function, only function. So when we talk specifics, we talk about gen general things to forgive, Yes, whatever comes up, it's all for forgiveness. There's nothing else, nothing else to achieve in this life. There's no purpose, there's no goal to achieve. The only thing is through forgiveness, we see this thing as already gone and finished. There is no choice, that's the only choice, to choose forgiveness as my only function in this world. And also, um, I lost my train. What do, you, what do you add to that? <laughs> I mean, but, I, I thought, that's the only choice. And also, what? <laughs> what? <I'm not> <laughs> only function. Only function. And if you just kind of take that in, you know, for a moment, you go, wow, that really is simple. That's really the simplicity of I just have one function. Then think about all the the things in the world that you seem to have, that you seem to possess, that you seem to own, or that seem to be under your control, that must be an illusion, because you can't really own it, possess it, control it. But, but to channel everything towards forgiveness, just to say, wow, if that really is my one function, then that would mean that, that everything would just need to serve that function. And that to me is like this that was like my calling experience. When I felt Jesus was calling me, I felt like Jesus was saying, give me your mind. Let me use your mind, and let me use everything in your world. And, and it was like a, one of those, like Mother Teresa had her calling when she was on a train. 
She was chugging through India, and all of a sudden, it came upon her, her calling. She felt her calling. And to me, I had that moment back, probably in the 1980s, where I felt like, I feel like I'm, there's a calling happening here. And, and Jesus was basically saying, give it all to me. Let me use it for a purpose that's for the good of the whole. Let me give everything that you seem to own and possess. Give me your hands and your feet. Give me the use of your body. Give me your skills and abilities. Give me your resources. Give me everything that you have in your mind. Give me your ambitions. Give me your future goals. Give it all to me, and I will use it as a blessing for the whole universe. And, and that was kind of a, that's that moment you were just talking about, where it's like suddenly, you know, it's not about what's going to happen in the future. It's that sense of, I'm no longer in the driver's seat, trying to drive my own car. I'm a passenger in the car, and Jesus is driving the car. And that there's something freeing about that conversion moment. Yeah, and why do we want to change anything in the world? Because I believe the external world determines my happiness. You know, whether how the external world turn out will determine my inner state. But the thing is, forgiveness gives me everything I want. Like Jesus said in one of the lessons, what, can you, what do you want that forgiveness cannot give you? So to be able to see the false as false, comes back to our true identity is the true happiness. And to think this world, you know, if we hold our identity as a dreamer, uh, as a dream character, and there is an external world going on, there's always, always, always going to be pleasure and pain. They're the same thing. They're both guilt. They're both guilt as believing I'm this individual. Just by that belief, there is a guilt, and the guilt split into Pleasure, guilt, and pain, guilt. The good guilt and bad guilt. So in this world, you just get trapped into, I hope I get more of the pleasure guilt. But really, it's the same thing. And then there is no choice, even in that way. You know, how do I feel? There is no, there is no relief in this world. You know, forgiveness gives us the opportunity to bring, to, to put a mind completely back into our true identity you know, onto this, this dreamer of the dream, not the dream character. And that's where, you know, we, we actually don't even have the question of, I hope the script will turn out a certain way, because why? Why does that even matter to me? You know, it doesn't determine anything. Yeah, you know, we talk about what is your purpose, but to the dream figure, to the human being, the purpose is completely out of awareness. You know, the human being, Sentimentally, since I think sentimentally I'd like to keep reading this blue book however many years it takes and eventually choose the right purpose. But as long as you're identified with the dream character as a figure on the screen, you're not back at the point where you can make a choice. You have to be the dreamer of the dream before you can allow another purpose to be given for the dream. As long as you believe you're a dream figure, you've forgotten that you're dreaming. You know how it seems like real, when people say, what's happening in, the, in your daily life, your real world? It's not talking about the real world like the Course talks about. You know, when you're talking about this to somebody and they go, come on, get real. How are you going to pay the bills? How are you going to put food on the table? Get real. I mean, when I was in university, I had all these graduate students around me and I was questioning everything. I was really taking but this was before Jesus came on board with the Course, I was, I was questioning everything, everything. At church, I was questioning everything. I was questioning every belief, every value. I would take nothing because some expert said it was true. I was pondering and questioning, like the ancient Greeks did, you know, sitting around in the, the pools and questioning the nature of what was presented to them instead of just assuming things to be so. And finally, the graduate assistants, the people around me said, David, just stop it. Stop it. It's annoying. It's absolutely annoying to be questioning underlying assumptions with everything. Are you some kind of philosopher? You're not even in philosophy. What the heck are you questioning everything for? You, you know, what are you doing? Get a life. Get a life, man. You know, it's like, stop it. 
And I said, okay, let's go with that a bit. Get a life. Uh, what do you mean by get a life? It's like, get in debt like everybody else. Get a mortgage, get children, get, get you know, get a partner, you know, get a career. Come on, man, get a life. And I said, oh, so that's a life. So that's what I should be getting, is all of that. And I said, and I said, what happens when I get a life? Then what? They said, yes, you'll do what all the millions and billions have done before you. You'll grow old, you'll get sick, and you'll die. <laughs> I said, that's absolutely unacceptable. <laughs> absolutely. I was probably in my 20s in graduate school, looking into the eyes of my friends and my graduates. If that's a life, I'm sorry. Said, well, the last person that uh, kind of let go of of that life, for eternal life, was Jesus Christ. Well, I think I would rather live the life of Jesus Christ, inspired by Jesus Christ. If eternal life is, is where this is all heading, I can go for it. But I'm not so interested in getting a life, getting a wife, getting a, a mortgage, getting in debt, credit card debt, student loan. I've already got student loan debt. You want me to get more of a life than that? Yes, yes, get more in debt. <laughs> get really deep in debt, like the rest of us. <laughs> Sorry, that does not, I don't like the way your story ends. I don't like the sickness and death part, you know. It doesn't seem fulfilling. It doesn't seem like that's my destiny to just go the ways, well they said millions, billions have gone that way before. What makes you think you're so different? I don't really care about being different. I just don't think that the death part is, is destiny. I think there has to be more than death. There has to be more than death. And then the Course came in my life almost like as an answer to a prayer, like, and yes, and here's your, here's your training manual for forgiving and opening to eternal life. So, you know, when you put it in that kind of context, you, know, you can see that you can, you do have to kind of repent and turn away from the past, the ways of the world, those those, you know, the ways of the world are many and the, the, the pathway to truth is the straight and narrow. I said, well, I'm interested in the straight and narrow, actually. It sounds pretty good. I just need to be shown what that is. I want to really be honestly shown what the straight and narrow is and I'm willing to, to take it. Okay, could you review the pleasure and pain concept that just went in one ear and out the other? I don't get that. Well, in A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, it's impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain. And so, it kind of relates to the thing I was talking about in the Bible, eat, drink, and be merry, for one day we shall die. It was almost, that's more of like, make the best of it. And pleasure and pain sounds a little bit du like duality, doesn't it? Um, and so, I remember when I was going through A Course in Miracles, uh, I was reading the text and uh, I, I was reading the subheadings, you know, you're going through, you're reading the chapters. The first time you read it, you come to the subheading, Attraction to Guilt. I was like, ooh, I don't know. Doesn't sound like a very appetizing uh, subheading, but it'll surely get better the next one. I'll just read through it and get to the next one. Next one, attraction to pain. Okay, two in a row, attraction to guilt, attraction to pain. No wonder they didn't call this a course on love. This chapter is sounding pretty morbid, but let's move on to the next one. Attraction to death. Three in a row. Attraction to guilt, attraction to pain, attraction to death. And in those sections, he talks about it's impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain. Anything that reinforces the dream, reinforces the reality of the body, uh, is perpetuating the ego. It's perpetuating the dream. Now just think about pleasure and pain for a minute. When your body is in the middle of a migraine headache, a pounding migraine headache, are you really thinking about God? Is that what you're thinking about at that moment? Or are you thinking about 
Excedrin or Tylenol or some some kind of morphine, some something, anything, you know, to try to escape the pain that seems very real. You're not thinking about God. It's the body. Yes. And it, it even works the flip side, you know, when, when people talk about, well, when you're having an orgasm, are you thinking of God? Some people will try to <laughs> pull that one off, you know. I'm sure there probably are a lot of monks and nuns that thought, why did I take this call? And I could have, uh, there was even a friend who, who uh, who's a spiritual teacher and he was trying to come up with a, a name for his book and talk about marketing. You know what he titled his book? Cosmic Chocolate Orgasm. <laughs> marketing, but marketing for what? <laughs> Is what I would say. Cosmic Chocolate Orgasm. Now, what she was referring to with this pain and pleasure thing is we cannot understand anything from the surface of consciousness. In fact, we went to a movie yesterday, and what was it, Josh, you said after the movie, how did you find the movie? Well, he was chaotic. Chaotic. It was a chaotic movie, almost a disaster. <laughs> uh, and you can't understand anything at all from the surface of things. Because the surface is just a projection of a dualistic belief system. So you won't find the answers on the surface. But what Jesus does is he goes below the surface and he says, you have to look at the purpose of things. And then you can make a decision. That's how you can really free your mind. You can release the ego's purpose from your mind and accept the Holy Spirit's purpose. And once you accept the Holy Spirit's purpose, it will give a new purpose to everything. It will transfer everything and everyone in your world. So what he does when he's describing pleasure and pain is basically says that the purpose, whether you're seeking for pleasure or seeking for pain, you still are reinforcing the reality of the body. Because why? Because the spirit doesn't experience pleasure or pain. And remember, you're trying to release your mind from the ego and come back to the spiritual awareness of everything. So you're, that's the big trick of this world. The ego has made fool's gold. It's made pleasure as something very attractive, and therefore when the mind's attracted to it, it doesn't realize that it's attracted to guilt. If you go back and read that section on the attraction of guilt, you can see this is the dynamic that the ego does not want raised into awareness. Because as soon as you raise it into awareness, you will say, this is ridiculous, I'm not going to be a slave to this mechanism anymore. I'm not going to reinforce the reality of the body. I want to reinforce the reality of the spirit. And when I'm reinforcing the reality of the body, then I'm just saying I want to sleep. Like Cypher in the Matrix. Put me back in the Matrix. Put me, you know, he wants to go back. Uh, he, he wants to go back to sleep. I want to be an actor. Yes, Mr. Reagan. You see? Some of you remember the first Matrix movie? It's very seductive. So, what Jesus does is he says, you have to be clear on the purpose of the Holy Spirit versus the purpose of the ego. And he says, comes right out and he says, the ego's purpose for the body and the world, the ego's purpose for the body is pride, pleasure, and attack. He comes right out and gives you the ego's three purposes for the use of the body. Pride, pleasure, and attack. And then he gives you the Holy Spirit's purpose for the body. The Holy Spirit uses the body solely as a means of communication. That's right, the Spirit wants to smile through you, laugh through you, hug through you, offer kind words of gentle love and encouragement through you. Isn't that what we liked the best about Gandhi? Isn't that what we liked about Mother Teresa? and resonated with, isn't that what we resonated with with Jesus? Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And even when they, the woman was caught, so to speak, in the act of adultery, and they brought her before Jesus, what did Jesus say to her? I condemn you not. I condemn you not. Even when they, the men had caught her in the act of adultery, he wasn't going to judge her. And when he said, go your way and sin no more, all he was saying is, go your way and stay in alignment with God. 
he did not judge her, and he offered her a blessing. That's all that Christ could do. There was absolutely no judgment or condemnation. Now that's using the body for the spirit. Jesus was a prime example of giving over 100% of, of mind, of consciousness for the spirit to use. And the body was like a little puppet. It was simply acting out the spirit flowing through it, speaking through it, gentleness, kindness, raising the dead, healing the sick. <coughs> you know, it was it was a very powerful demonstration. But you know, you see how different that is from these egoic drives for pride, pleasure, and attack. It it simply keeps the mind asleep and dreaming, and that's not the goal. The goal is to to wake up. Reality. So the guilt part of that is. Um we would be guilty of um, engaging in what the ego wants versus what spirit wants? I don't quite understand the, where the guilt comes in. Yeah, the guilt, the ego is guilt. So anytime you use the body of the world for the ego's purposes, it's simply to reinforce guilt. So for example, it's not so much, we were talking about food, and that was one of our discussions at lunchtime. It's not so much that people feel guilty around certain foods, or certain fatty foods, or so forth. You know, that's more on the surface, where the nutritionists say, you know, don't, um, don't eat these foods, and do eat these foods. They're good foods and bad foods. Stay away from the bad foods. And what happens when you eat the bad foods? Guilt. Guilt. And I mean, you see that, you know, um, I, I think I saw it was like guilty cookies or uh, guilty ice cream. They they're starting to put it in the titles now. <laughs> guilty pleasures and guiltily delicious and you know it's you know the association sinfully sinfully delicious. You know you see how this works. The thing about it is it's not that there's anything wrong with these ice creams or or things. Guilt is just an error to be corrected. It's not there's not guilty foods. We shouldn't feel guilty about eating certain food. But it's this thing in the mind where there's the pursuit of the pleasure is, is the attraction to the guilt. Because it's the purpose for which the ego would use the body in the world. That's where the guilt's getting generated. Now, you say, what's the alternative? Well, it's miracle working. You're, we're called to be miracle workers, you know. And We've got lots of examples of that, but I can just say over the last 20 years that as, as I've just got into my miracle working function, joy is important. Joy is what comes from miracle working. And there's even a part of the Course in Miracles where Jesus <laughs> says, you cannot tell the difference between joy and pain. That's pretty strong. He comes right out in A Course in Miracles and says, you in your deluded state of mind, where everything's twisted around and mixed up and you don't know anything, you can't tell the difference between joy and pain. Because the pleasure thing comes in, because the mind has confused joy and pleasure, and as Francis said, pleasure and pain are the same, would you call it pleasure guilt and pain guilt? The, the guilt is in both ways, but you can't tell the difference between pleasure and joy, therefore you can't tell the difference between pain and joy, and therefore when you seek for pleasure and find pain, you're all confused. Like, what's happening here? Where, where is my escape hatch? When you're still choosing guilt, and you don't realize that you're choosing guilt. There's pleasureful guilt and painful guilt, you see? So this is part of the sneakiness of the ego. It's quite ingenious, it's quite deceptive, and so what's the alternative? What am I supposed to take a vow now and that's it? Uh, for Lent this year or, no, no, my New Year's resolution. No pleasure. No more pleasure. No physical pleasure, no psychological pleasure. No pleasure. I want bliss. I want to this year. I'm going for joy this year, actually. 
Uh, that's my New Year resolution. I'm going to have a joyful year. A joyful, blissful, graceful, happy year. Now, what you can't go at it from trying to like, take a vow, like people take a vow of celibacy and poverty. You can't take a, a pleasure vow, <laughs> a devoid of pleasure. What you can do is get into your function, which is miracle working, which will inspire joy. That's why it's called a course in miracles. It's not called a course in letting go of pleasure. I don't think that would sell. <laughs> 1.5, 2 million, whatever. Wouldn't translate to other languages. But it is a course in miracles because miracles are our function. Jesus, Holy Spirit, inspire miracles in us and through us. And joy will take you like nothing else. When you start to feel intrinsic, bubbling up joy, Carl Rogers' joy, like we were talking about, Jeff and I, where there's such an inspiration and such a helpfulness that it just becomes your life. You think, I don't know what I was doing before, but I was lost, and now I'm found, and now the joy is bubbling. That's inspirational. That, that literally takes you away. Because if you had joy, do you really think pain and pleasure would matter to you? If you had joy that was inspired by your source, you wouldn't even think twice. It would not be a sacrifice at all to you. Who can be, who can be sad at the sacrifice of nothing? Who can, you know, you read the, the section on the manual for teachers, what is the real meaning of sacrifice? Jesus comes out and says, God's teachers can have no regrets on giving up the pleasures of the world. That's a direct sentence from A Course in Miracles. But it's because you're coming into joy, you're coming into your joyful function. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, from the Bible. That's, that's your salvation. That's, that's where your healing occurs. And that's where you're literally lifted up, you know, like love lifts us up where we belong. You're literally transcendent of the ego's tricks when you follow your miracle working function. So this course is not merely the escape from pain and fear and anger. This course aims at the experience of joy. And that's what I talked about at lunch when I said Bill Thetford left the East Coast and he left Northern California saying, I have to find joy. That's got to be the, the ultimate experience of A Course in Miracles is actually going into your joyful, miracle function. And that's, I would say for both of us, that's kind of how it's gone, you know, in the sense of um, the things, you know, how they say, water off the duck's back, the things of the world, the pursuits of the world, fall away in your miracle function. Because you simply have no need of them anymore. Who would want limitation when you could have an unlimited awareness? Who would choose tinker toys of time and space when you're called by eternity. You see? It's the juxtaposition of that. There's lots of parables about that. That's why we share these things. Because it's where we anticipated loss or anticipated grief. We have found the happy, unexpected, lightheartedness instead. Wow. That's, if, if that was the trade, if you're going to trade pain and suffering for a happy lightheartedness and a joyfulness, that's the kind of trade, so-called trade, you can make. But it's a convincing job. The Holy Spirit's got one major convincing job with the sleepy mind. So, uh, the, the ego wants to think that it has to give something up to get joy. Yeah. And it's falling. It's, it, it can be used by the spirit because when, at the beginning when we study the Course, the ego always thinks it's something that will be beneficial to the ego. 
we have a better life, we have even a more joyful personal life. You know, that, that's the only thing ego can, can understand. It doesn't really understand anything beyond itself. It doesn't understand anything that is at the level of the whole, but not duality. So it, it, so it will be motivated to, to study along, thinking that it will be joyful, and it is true. You truly will be joyful, but it's through the collapsing of the ego and everything <coughs> the ego knows that it will happen. You know, the Holy Spirit is using, is using everything. So. Yeah, I think it's this amnesia thing that when the, when the mind seemed to fall from grace, it had a total amnesia about heaven and God. As if, it, as if there never was a heaven. I mean, you know how when, when somebody has amnesia in this world and they forget their identity and they kind of wander around with no clue of who they are or where they are or what they are. This amnesia from spirit or from heaven or from God is so complete in awareness, not in reality obviously, there is no amnesia in heaven, but it's so complete that everything of heaven is forgotten and, and linear time then becomes the known. And God and heaven become the unknown. So imagine from the ego's perspective that you're reading this book and you're opening, you know, sentimentally you're going, I, I, I think I like where this is going. I, I'm pretty sure intuitively that this is the pathway, an authentic pathway back to God. But remember, it's only the ego that reads. The spirit doesn't read. The ego is actually reading the book along with you and going, if I like that one at all. <laughs> and it's like, it's your companion as you're reading the book. Your mind's trying to take it in, but the ego's actually moving the eyeball over and it's like interpreting, and it's right with you interpreting everything, saying, I don't know, it's a little bit fishy. Because this book seems to be asking you to let go of the known, the, lit, the physical linear world, everything you've known throughout all history and your whole, all your experiences as a human being, let go of the known for the big unknown. God is the big unknown. That's why we have atheists, because they say there's no proof in this world for the existence of God. And then we have believers who say, well, God created the heavens and the earth, and the devil came in here, and there's a war going on, and you better be on the right side. You don't want to be on the wrong side. You don't want to be on the devil's side. Uh, and there's all these things that were made up, but basically you're being asked to trust in miracles to take you to a place that you don't have in your awareness. This total amnesia has occurred. So the ego is going to be doubting every little step along the way. Even when you have your, a mystical experience, the ego is going to go, what was that? You better not ever talk about this with anybody, or they're going to all say you're crazy. But you have a near-death experience. I call them near-life experience, because you are in the life. They're called NDEs in this world. You have a near-death experience, and then you don't want to talk about it, because you don't want the neighbors to think you're that weird and strange that you have a journey into the light or something. You see how the ego is going to be there every step along the way, saying, don't go for this. This is just too far out. And don't be gullible, right? Because you're going for this big unknown thing. And nobody, nobody knows for sure about this God thing. You know, what if it's a big hoax? I actually had a student of mine one time who came to me and she said, David, what if A Course in Miracles is the biggest hoax? Is the biggest hoax of all time? What if the whole Course in Miracles is just filled with lies? Just one big grammatical, correct, you know, full of words <laughs> trick. And I just looked her in the eye and I said, You really had that thought? She said, Yes. <laughs> Come on, David. Haven't you ever <laughs> once had that thought about the Course? And I said, you really had that thought? I, I know, I have never had that thought with the Course. 
I, I mean, when I got it and I started opening it up, I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. I just had tears coming down, like, oh my God. I've, I've got an answer to a prayer, and I know it in my heart, and I never once had that doubt thought that she was trying to present to me. You know, I was really like astounded, like, you really had that thought? Like, wow, that's amazing that you would have that thought. For me, it was such a, a deep recognition, like I, this was, I was really being called home. It was so strong. So, you, you take that recognition that's in your heart and you trust it, and you, you go with it, and you give yourself over to those miracles, and you say, yes, Holy Spirit, convince me. You show me the truth of this. You show me the reality. You, you give me an actual experience. And that was the prayer of my heart. Then when I had my revelation experience, I was, whoa. I was like, big yes. <laughs> and then another one, big yes. And then the third one. And each time I had my revelatory experiences, I was eye-gazing. I was in an open-eyed, eye-gazing meditation with a friend of mine, where we were just sitting face-to-face, -face, gazing into each other's eyes in deep prayer and stillness, and then the world disappeared. You know, that would be, it was actually through relationship. It was through being open to see the Christ in a brother that the revelations occurred. You know? And to me, that, that seemed perfectly in line with what the Course was saying, you know. You can do this with your brothers and sisters. You don't have to do these long, tedious periods of meditation. Those ways will work. In the, in the I Need Do Nothing section, he talks about that. But your way will be different. A holy relationship is given you as a means of awakening. Very specific. And then he even goes on beyond holy relationship to say, uh, he defines what holy relationship is. He says, you and your brother are together. He's just saying you're one mind. You're not your brother's keeper. You are literally your brother. Love thy neighbor as thyself. As thyself. It's like literally letting the whole veil of differences fall away and say, oh my, my gosh, when you meet anyone, remember it's a holy encounter. As you see him, you will see yourself. As you treat him, treat yourself. You, you, what's the last one? As you think. think of him. As you think of him, you will think of yourself. Never forget this, for in him you will find yourself or lose yourself. Wow, that's, that's intimate. That's like, I can feel the presence of love in that. It's really like saying, you, you know, this is it. This is, your whole purpose of life is self-realization, to know thyself. The Greeks talked about it. Do we have questions? So my question is, being that we have students of all different um, levels and years in the course and things like that. Um, just wondering what your advice or what Holy Spirit's advice would be for somebody who says, this is just too hard for me. I don't get it. It's way over my head. I don't even understand half the words that I'm reading. But yet, they're still interested. They still have a willingness to want to learn. Just wondering what your thoughts would be on that. <laughs> well, I had a, a student of mine who basically, you know, would welcome me into her house and her heart, and she would have her, her staff, she was the CEO of a company, she would have her staff come over to meet me and, and everything like this, and, and her son and her daughter, uh, when her daughter became pregnant, uh, she invited me into the, you know, the delivery room area to be there at the birth of her, her grandson and everything like this. And um, so the, the woman who's a student of mine, she just really went for this. She just 
dove in and she said, I'm just going for God and I'm going to just go all the way with this and let go. And of course there were a lot of reflections around her, like, what are you doing? You've gone off the deep end, you've, you've gone way too far, this is dangerous and all this and this. But she persisted and persisted and interestingly enough, years went by and her daughter grew up into her 20s and uh, she went to visit her daughter and uh, it was interesting, her daughter sat down with her and said, listen, I'm not into any of this. I'm into being a mom. I'm into my kids and I'm into the world and I tell you, you know, uh, David is your path. You know, the course is your path. You need to follow this. You need to go for this because it's you. And I'm doing my thing and you're doing your thing. And she said, uh, the daughter said, David is helping people wake up. He's helping people wake up from the whole thing. And that's his thing. And that's your thing. And that's not my thing. <laughs> she, goes, she goes through this all. And so my friend came back and told me the whole encounter. And I said, how beautiful. How wonderful. How present your daughter even was into that experience of acknowledging. She was basically saying, I'm not ready. David's waking people up. You're ready. You need to be going and doing what you're doing. So go and do it. And let me do what I'm doing. Because here's where I'm at. Now eventually, that was even a little while ago, eventually she started ordering books, the course book, the daughter did, and uh, getting into this mountain car and, and mystics and quantum physics and all these things. In her time, uh, she started opening that way, but that was a clear statement. And I did get an email last night, because I checked my mail and there were more than there was somebody who's into the course, but he just got married and, and his wife, he said, my wife's into illusions and wow, this is calling me. I've got major resistance going on. I'm like less than 268 or something and this and that. And I reminded him, remembered this uh, part of the course that says, when you find resistance high, and dedication weak, you are not ready. Do not fight yourself. Isn't that a beautiful line out of A Course in Miracles? Here, I actually opened it up one time when I was going through a period of resistance. I did the I Ching thing, I popped the course open, and I was like, wow! <laughs> a tool that tells you to set it down. <laughs> I said, that's really it inspired piece of inspiration. So that's the thing, once you start to realize that, that it's not about convincing anybody, it's not about trying to make things happen faster for people, or having them turn to the right theology and get away from their dualistic thinking and this and this. Ultimately, it's what uh, Frances was talking about when she had this moment of just starting to see that all the characters just were acting out thoughts in the mind, thoughts in consciousness. So if you're perceiving a brother or a sister who needs to get it, who's definitely not there yet for whatever, that's simply a doubt thought that's still being held in mind that is denying that we're all the same. You see how it throws it out as, well, that person's got a long way to go, or that person's definitely not there yet. It's simply a doubt thought of identity, of you being the Christ, and projecting it out and having them act it out. They're just acting out what the mind's wishes are. The mind still wishes to be a little separate, so it has this character act something out of that character. Or even like in the, in the preschool room, you know, the, the little characters just are all thoughts. And, and whenever we see something, we say, wow, they're definitely this or they're that, or they're not there, with, or whatever, we're still trying, the ego's trying to throw it out as if somebody could hold us back, or somebody's not fully aware of who they really are. As if we, we knew that we were, they weren't. You see how, how tr as tricky that is, it's, the ego is very ingenious, that's what this projection thing is all about, ingenuity. Me, me, of course. <laughs> 
today that they're saying, let's say, I, I have a good friend who's saying to me, I'd really like to do this, but I don't really get it. Um, what I'm hearing you say is, maybe it's just not time for them. Maybe if they're not really um, being able to come into a deeper level of learning or whatever. Um, it, it's okay. Obviously, I think it's okay. Um, but they feel maybe it's not okay. I should be doing it. I should get it. I should understand it. Why am I not? And I don't really know what my function in that or response to that really is. See what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if there is any response. Well, the thing about it is, if, if we're teaching what we would learn and our whole purpose is to answer the call, then our state of mind becomes that living demonstration to that change of mind that, that they're looking for. In other words, if someone says that, that's clearly a call for love, but it's not their call for love. It's our own. Because anytime we perceive somebody lacking something, we're simply not seeing the Christ in them, which simply means we're not experiencing ourselves as the Christ to see how it works. So you, you get loosened up from the form ideas, and Jesus does say, you know, the Holy Spirit sees everything as love or a call for love. But, and everyone's pretty familiar with that passage in the Course, that every, the Holy Spirit sees everything as love or a call for love. But what happens after that? Jesus says, you cannot do this, he says. He comes right out after he's talking about the Holy Spirit's function. You cannot do this because you are too bound to form and do not know what content is. That's very helpful. That last part is helpful. So it, it's really just a call as you keep your practice going and you keep watching your mind and opening to miracles, opening to be used in miracles, becoming more joyful and even more joyful and more consistently joyful. You can't change or fix anybody, but you can present the attitude the demonstration of a changed mind, of a mind that is aligned with the source. And in that, you've reached your full responsibility. There's nothing more responsible that you can do, but that's your full responsibility, is your attitude. And, and it's very glorious because then, you see how relaxing that is too. You're not responsible for other people's behavior. In fact, you could go a little further you're actually not directly in control of, of even the body that you think is your own. Because remember, it's part of a prearranged script, and you have no control over the world you make. So you can't actively, directly control the body. What you do comes from what you think, and you can choose your thoughts. But you don't even have direct control over the puppet. That the choice of the purpose, the one you align with in your mind, the Holy Spirit of the ego, is going to move the puppet. But you, it's hard to fathom, you know, because we're so ingrained with, you know, if you're overweight, it's your fault, and you need to stop putting food in that mouth. You see how the world is always looking at it from a behavioral standpoint. If you're smoking, you got to what? Stop smoking. Oh, if you're drinking, you know, stop drinking, stop drinking. And people who have gone through alcoholics and alcoholism say, yeah, yeah, stop drinking. Yeah, okay, right, yeah. I tell myself that, stop drinking. You know, you, know, you see, you've got to go much deeper. You've got to go really deep, deep, deep into the mind. And I would say, this is the sneaky one we really have to give up, is this idea of personal responsibility. How many of us were raised with the idea of personal responsibility? <laughs> you have to personally be responsible for earning a living. Even something as simple as that. I mean, most of us, you're, you're, responsible, you're personally responsible for everything, including everything you do and don't do, and this and this. Yeah. Now, if you were responsible for the behavior, well, I could see where some guilt could come in. 
uh, because this puppet is prone to a lots of different behaviors. And if you're directly responsible for the behavior, good chance of finding innocence, huh? How, you're going to have to find innocence where you're responsible for behavior. Imagine somebody like Charlie Manson, if you're responsible for your behavior. No, that's Adolf Hitler. You're responsible for your behavior. You see where guilt comes in from associating the behavior with some kind of standard, and you're going to be guilty if you're going to stay with that. But what if you were responsible for what you think and not for what you do? Because what you do just comes from what you think. Wouldn't it be better to focus all your effort on changing your thoughts from ego to Holy Spirit and, and letting go of the concern about the behavior and all the judgments that go on the behavior and all the judgments that go on the body? Think how much guilt comes in from judging the body as to this, to that, good at this, good at that. You see how the ego's got quite a system going on there. And the Course comes along and says, you are not responsible for what you do, but for what you think. And it is this level we must work. We must work at the level of thoughts. So this was really helpful for me. I mean, I had to be convinced of this. Like, you know, I, my whole life, I was, the whole parable of David, concerned about the body, the body, personality traits, I'm shy, you know, it's a curse. How am I going to be girls? How am I going to meet women? How am I going to have a relationship if I'm in the curse of shyness? The curse going with me, you know, you see, you're going nowhere with that. You're just stuck. You think, oh, personality traits don't change very much. Although in my case, it's been quite a transformation. But those are just symbols. It's really I've changed my thinking. And then everything else followed suit. So, there's another line that's important, because I've heard people misuse the Course and say, you are responsible for the starving children in Africa. You are responsible for that tsunami. You are responsible for that plague, and so on and so forth. And what is my answer to that? Because people go, well, you know, it's our mind, and you know, we made that tornado, and we, we, we just destroyed all these hundreds of people in this tsunami, and so forth. Jesus says in the Course, you are not responsible for the error. You are responsible for accepting the correction for the error. Doesn't that lift your heart? You are not responsible for the error. You are responsible for accepting the correction. He does go on to say, do not project the error to time. You see how important that is to accept the correction. If you keep projecting it to time, like, I'll get this someday, or sometime in the future, I'll, this person will make the right decision and I'll accept the atonement. Persons don't accept the atonement. It's all the undoing of everything we believe about form and coming inward to accept the correction. We are not responsible for the error, we are responsible for accepting the correction. I could just feel that in my heart when I first read that. I said, okay, now you've got me. I'm going to come in the tractor beam to that innocence. I'm going to make, I'm going to change my mind about my mind. <laughs> this course is about changing your mind about your mind. Not about changing your behavior. And it's certainly not about changing the world either. Isn't that a relief? That means we don't have to go around trying to always be fixing the world, fixing people, making the world a better place. The light oh, button, you probably hear me. Um, yeah, the recording cam. The recording cam. <laughs> well, a piece of recording. Um, I have found that changing my behavior is much easier than changing. Yes, I would agree. It, it, it's at that level. It, it would be like saying, though, changing the effect seems much easier than changing the cause. Yeah, I would say, yeah, that's, that's most people's experience. It's easier actually to change behavior, to modify behavior, than it is to have a total change of mind. In fact, there's one point where Jesus addresses that. He says something like, 
you may wonder how long it will take you to change your mind so completely. And you may find that this is quite depressing. <laughs> Ask yourself, how long is it is? You see, that's his answer. <laughs> he gives the predicament and then he gives how long is an instant. That we literally have the power in our mind to change our mind in an instant. And there are even examples. Uh, I think it's already done, that's why we have the power to do it. And even people like Eckhart Tolle, you know, who have the park, park bench experience that seem to have such a change in consciousness. Isn't that a beautiful witness? You know, it may, for yourself, you may have much longer curriculum time involved, but, but isn't it wonderful to have a witness of, of actually being on a park bench and having a surrender experience where you, your consciousness has changed to such an extent you know, that you just start to just spontaneously teach it. Yeah, that's a nice witness. So with uh, 10 minutes left before the hour, I just wanted to thank everybody for showing up again. If you feel called to contribute more to the love offering to cover expenses uh, to have David and Francis here, please feel free to do so. But to uh, move into closing the actual workshop, I just wanted to invite David to take us through a guided meditation of some sort for the purposes of healing. And if we could all just participate in the meditation together, even though this whole experience has been quite meditative, I think uh, I just feel a nice energy in that direction. Okay, and then are we back here at 7? Yes, and then the movie will begin at 7. We'll be right in here. I'm going to have a TV set up um, so that we can watch a movie together. And I'm hoping that the TV will be big enough for everybody. Mm -hmm. I intend that it will be. Okay. Everyone just sit back in your chairs, settle into a very comfortable position. Take a deep in-breath. Let it go. Feel yourself sinking deeper and deeper inward. And feeling more and more relaxed. And just allow yourself to feel that natural state of gratitude bubbling up within you. For everything you've allowed yourself to hear today. Remembering that deep within your heart, you have all the answers to any problem that confronts you today or that will ever confront you. you have allowed yourself to hear the answers, the insights, and to recognize what you deeply wanted to hear and to recognize. Presence today, the presence 
of the Holy Spirit has showered blessings upon us all. And perhaps the blessing is a simple as a question that you allowed to enter into your awareness. A question you had not even allowed yourself to ask until today. And with the question that will have great application in your life and in your mind. Perhaps you even experience the calling in your heart. very, very deep calling that will bring to you the experience of joy. If you follow it, and where before you may have had plans and ambitions, future life. Now you feel a present trust directing the way. And you feel at ease with this present trust. feel that you don't need to know about future hypothetical scenarios. You feel a loosening of personal responsibility. as you accept responsibility for your state of mind. And maybe you feel the ego plans of the future beginning to fall away. This present trust directs the way. feel you don't have to figure it all out. As you rest in the Holy Spirit. And with this, the anxiety of the future begins to fade away. of being a responsible adult of being a responsible person and all the weights of duties and obligations as well. All because you let present trust direct the way. 
personally in control of life. Now you rest in the simple idea Just invite everybody. I invite everyone to stay anchored in that presence over the next few hours until we see each other at 7 p.m. where we will watch. Thanks for sharing. And your commentary. Or we can then say, thanks for sharing. <laughs> <laughs>